you know, 10 years has passed. ESG is now almost every of us agree it's important. But we very often disagree. What is more greener? For example, some people claim the electric, electric car Tesla is very green. But others argue that if you including the cost and the pollution produce those batteries, Tesla is actually not that green things. So ESG evaluation is very complex and many different measures often conflict. One measure is offered by MSCI for the firm level ESG, which is sometimes not dis disagree with Morningstar Sustainalytics or the Referisk or Thomson Reuters asset for. So they have all different things. My first question for the panelists is, what do you think should be a good criterion for ESG measurement? Some of you mentioned there is this new international sustainability standard, but uh, you know, very often a lot of this international new, especially at the beginning, very rough. Is that far away from the day-by-day -day things you evaluate whether it's the true ESG good things? So as investor, how do you choose and use those non-standardized ESG information to help you climb to make sure this is truly an ESG investment? I, let's just uh, still start from the same order. Remy, would you like to talk about it? Thanks. Sure, and, and clearly this, this question about um, the divergence of every CSG rating is, is one that has gone um, to be discussed quite, quite a lot. So maybe a, a few things to, uh, to highlight first. Um, what sometimes uh, is overlooked is that um, in the ESG space, there are various um, ratings of scores that are done by entities that are solving for very, very different problem, very, very different problem. And, and, and so uh, in particular, and I think Anne was sort of highlighting that aspect about uh, you know, making sure that um, there is a sort of long-term return for long-term cash flows, for long-term liabilities, to pay pension. The, you know, that's one objective essentially you know, to integrate you know, ESG into an investment process in order to identify long-term risk or long-term opportunities uh, uh, for companies. So climate change you know, is a long-term risk. It's also on the green side, a long-term opportunity. And so if you're trying to help, you know, through a metric to uh, answer those questions, then you create a rating, which is really our philosophy as well, uh, a rating which tends to put a lot of emphasis on a number of key material issues that would affect a company in a given sector. So for example, um, you know, um, you, uh, if you're, uh, a butler, you know, access to water is a really, really critical, you know, issue. If you don't have water, you don't have a business, right? Very material. Now, if you keep the same topic of water management, um, you know, if, if you take um, an advertising agency, you know, you can do a lot of good things, you know, in terms of managing water in your offices, it's a good thing to do, but it may not be a material thing, you know, uh, overall in terms of when you assess the risk of, of an entity like that. So, so if you take the world from uh, a view of you no know, long-term financial assessment, you're building your metric, the rating in a given way. But if you come from another angle, which is what you would call more of a normative angle, so you want to promote good practices in a certain dimension, then you, know, you will put uh, you know, the advertising agency that does a lot on water management and the bottling one at the same level, because they're both really potentially doing a lot, you know, in order to uh, promote a concept. And that may explain a lot of the differences if, if you want between the ratings. And that's why if you, again, want to serve pension funds or asset manager and help in that process, then this materiality concept, you know, is, is really, really important. And that can explain why certain ratings could be different. The other aspect very quickly is that ESG, in a sense, is, is blending three dimensions. Uh, each of the dimensions, by the way, have you know, quite a number of, of different uh, sub-dimensions. And so without this materiality angle, then you're left with 
potentially putting a lot of emphasis everywhere on the environmental side and then ignoring governance or vice versa. And so uh, that may explain again um, why there could be some big differences if you only look at the environmental part, for example, or only look at the uh, governance part, you will have differences, you know, by the nature of it. Maybe I'll stop here you know, <laughs> not to take too much time, but that's, you know, one element of, yeah, the, you know, the discussion. <coughs> Yeah, it's clear, not an easy topic. Uh, Granville? Yeah, just, uh, you know, Remy was, uh, you know, highlighting a lot of the complexity that exists in the ESG ratings uh, landscape. And, uh, you know, over time, uh, with uh, better disclosure and better data, I'm sure the market is going to uh, sort that out. Uh, but underlying uh, all of uh, ESG ratings and a lot of asset managers and asset owners, uh, you know, create their own proprietary uh, benchmarks or ESG ratings, many of them based on existing uh, rating products that are in the market now. Uh, and underlying all of that is the need for consistent and comparable data. And that's where uh, the SASB standards, uh, which are part of the Value Reporting Foundation, uh, uh, come in, you know, you have about, uh, you have over 160 asset owners and asset managers that have licensed the SASB standards uh, for various uses. Um, uh, you've got 22 of the largest asset managers globally that um, uh, reference the SASB standards in their proxy voting guidelines. Uh, so, uh, you know, you need basic, sound, uh, consistent and comparable data and market infrastructure to inform uh, the conclusions that investors are trying to draw when they use uh, ESG ratings uh, products. And, you know, we've mentioned the International Sustainability Standards Board. Uh, the intention of the IFRS is as the ISSB uh, moves through due process towards a, a climate disclosure standard in uh, 2022, uh, that in the interim, uh, that companies should continue to report against uh, uh, SASB and the TCFD uh, and other frameworks uh, in order to position themselves for uh, compliance with what the ISSB will ultimately uh, produce next year. Uh, so um, yes, there's a lot of, uh, of divergence in the ESG ratings uh, landscape. Uh, and over time, we very much believe that the consistent use of SASB standards and now the ISSB standards is going to reduce that range of, uh, of difference uh, to provide the market with, with uh, better and more useful information. Great, uh, Laura. So BlackRock is a big player in the ESG market. Uh, when you helping your clients to true, this is true ESG investment, what kind of information do you use? Do you use, uh, for example, the rating offered by MSCI or you use your own internal standards? We use both. We use a combination, right? So I, I certainly agree with Remy. I think Remy really framed the issue very well. And we certainly understand that ESG is trying to do a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, it's important to think about this concept of materiality and what environmental and social and governance uh, um, elements are really material to the credit worthiness or the profitability of a company. Um, the way we approach it is, uh, obviously, we we have dedicated teams that do diligence data sets. And I would say it's also really interesting to see that there's a lot of emerging data sets in the ESG space. Maybe, you know, the, the, the big broad ESG rating providers are the ones that you mentioned earlier, but there's a lot of emerging niche players. They either uh, adopt a different approach in the way that they, um, uh, they uh, capture and aggregate the data. It could be more, uh, more real time, uh, for example, through the 
use of some natural language processing or scraping news media and headlines and things of that sort with dictionaries built for that. Or it can be niche and uh, sort of focused on specific angles of ESG. Uh, think about data around uh, real-time methane emissions or, or, you know, some of these data that are used in, in some of, you know, in some uh, areas of capital markets that are more real-time indicators of certain things that you're interested in. And I would say there's probably like every day uh, some uh, data provider that approaches us, uh, you know, and asking if we're interested in that. So we spend a lot of time due diligence in data sets um, and really thinking about, first of all, if they're robust, if we can trust them, uh, if they tell us something useful, uh, and if it's something that we can build into the investment process. One big question is, can we turn this into an index? Can this become an insight that is useful for the construction of an index, for example? Obviously, we're in that business here. Um, and then, of course, you know, BlackRock's a big firm, and so all kinds of different approaches to investing from fundamental to more systematic, active, and passive. And our investors have access to a large number of data points. Uh, we have, of course, the MSCI ratings integrated into our own risk management system into Aladdin, and we have others as well. Uh, and so there's there's certainly a lot of opportunities for our portfolio managers, including the ones that are managing unconstrained strategies, to really think about, is this stuff relevant for what I'm doing and how can I incorporate that information? So it really runs the whole gamut. I think that at the end of the day, the way we think about it is we sort of offer a menu of options to our clients, right? It's very much, the lens is really very much uh, that of of having our clients be the ones that make a decision around what amount of ESG or what flavor of ESG they want to incorporate into their portfolios. And so the menu of options includes sort of simple approaches that really are more focused on aligning perhaps with values. So it's uh, approaches such as screening, for example. I, you know, it's very much of a legitimate uh, concern. I don't want to finance a certain activity. I don't want to put my money uh, in tobacco. I don't want to put my money in controversial weapons, things of that sort. Uh, but then, of course, uh, a different approach approach that our clients also uh, choose, uh, and, and we have, of course, products and options for that, is I would like to have a product that um, uh, optimizes with a very tight tracking <clears throat> error, something very similar to a traditional benchmark, but also improves on certain ESG uh, elements. It can be a reduction of carbon footprint. It can be an increase in the ESG score. Or another approach can be something that says, I would like to bet on the best performers in their own sector, in their own category, uh, on sustainability. And so this becomes an exercise around picking the better companies, the ones that have better practices, the ones that demonstrate better alignment with sustainability within their own sector. So you can still build diversified portfolios, but you're picking the, we call it best in class, the leaders in their own, uh, in their own sector or in their own space. And so there's really a lot of flavors that you can add to this uh, and ultimately uh, choice rests with our clients. Seems like even more complex. <laughs> I guess big companies like BlackRock, you have your internal capacity to do this, but many of the small asset managers, they might don't have, they for sure don't have this capacity. They might have to heavily rely on the public index like Remy's company providing, but both of them still can do things. These public firms, it's much harder for private markets. And this is a CalPERS. When you do, and when you do guys do this uh, pension funds, you do a lot of this private investment. How it's, I, in my imagination, it's gonna be even harder to think about what is the ESG evaluation for those private firms. As a pension fund investor, what would you say about what do you guys do to choose the ESG for private firms? Thanks. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I, I think Granville, Laura and Remy pointed out the fundamental problem, which is the lack of standardized reporting um, so we are often in the world of a guesstimate and or an estimate on things that matter. So the voice of investors in driving the standards and reporting, which can then go through the uh, internal audit process, be signed off by the audit committee, reviewed by the auditors, that is the way that we will ultimately get the quality of information. Now, which then the, that the next question is, well, what really matters? And that depends upon the investor. And even in the United States, where materiality um, is an important concept, but it's thought of as being 
narrow in relation to say the European approach. I would just like to reference that the Financial Accounting Standards Board definition essentially focuses on what the reasonable investor would consider to be of significance in the total mix of information. Sometimes people talk about ESG information must be material and we must be able to tie it to uh, short-term financial impact. No, the US FASB approach, and this is backed up by the Supreme Court uh, on, the, on this point, the materiality judgment is made by the investor. So if you look at CalPERS, first of all, our size really matters. We are um, a universal owner simply by having close to half a trillion dollars that we need to uh, be fiduciaries for. The second dimension that's relevant for us on materiality, and therefore that is the approach for us that defines the sustainability information we, we need or the ESG data as your uh, as you're saying, um, and that's our long-term horizon. We have to generate cash every year, as I said earlier, but we've got to grow this half a trillion at 6.8% per year consistently for decades. So when we step back and look at risk to our portfolio, it's the systemic risks like climate change, um, like the stability of the financial system, the impact on natural resources, we may not be able to find individual companies where this is uh, material at the issuer level, but these issues roll up across our portfolio and over time to become systemic risks. And we need to team up with others to, to tackle them. In the private markets, it's both easier um, and at the same time more difficult. So that sounds like a, um, a contradiction, but let me explain. In private markets, our main exposure is uh, through real assets and infrastructure. And on both of those asset classes, what we have done is work with other asset owners to build a framework for sustainability reporting. It's called the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark and also the same for infrastructure. In addition, we have a responsible contractor program in order to take care of reporting on wages, benefits, health and safety, employee engagement, and so forth. So in other words, the policies can be set. When we come to private equity, as I said, we've just launched a new initiative because there what we have to deal with is the limited partner structure. So this mm -hmm. is where the general partners are actually in a much stronger position than typically an investor, even a very large um, investment manager like BlackRock or an asset owner like CalPERS because typically the general partners have control of the company. Often they appoint directors who are professionally trained in the transition strategy that the company needs to make. So the challenge is to get the limited partners, CalPERS being one of the largest limited partners in the world, we know that our role as limited partners is to make sure that the general partner has this uh, agenda for sustainability integrated into the business plan. So the new private equity data convergence platform that we've developed is intended to, if you like, in private equity, lift all boats. Um, so I hope, I hope that's helpful. But um, I would also say, finally, that in the public markets, what information you need and how you use it is going to reflect your investment strategy. So for CalPERS in public equity, we're indexed. We run the money internally, so we have direct oversight of what's going on. And we know that engagement and proxy voting is the way that we can drive change. We have a very stable long-term holding in these companies. In our fixed income portfolio, which likewise is 96, 97% internally managed, it's actively managed. So the point of entry there for us in terms of integrating ESG analysis is in the due diligence, in the credit appraisal, uh, as we're choosing to select particular holdings and securities. So with an actively managed portfolio, it will be a different approach to the integration of information to uh, uh, a public equity index portfolio. But in the private markets, there is tremendous opportunity. And I think as we get going, it will, it will move very quickly because of the ownership structure gives more potential for influence by the GPs.
That's great. That seems like a business opportunity. Remy, I don't know whether your company is going to do something, do the ESG evaluation for private firms. That's a huge market. Uh, there's a huge demand as well. It's, that seems very interesting. There's potential collaboration with for companies like helpers or something to integrate resources. In the end, we want to see, we want to change the world. We want to make the, we want to use the way money talks to change the world, but how to do it, public and private market should probably join the force. Here I have a specific question for Laura. <laughs> so the other day I was checking this Vanguard, one of the Vanguard ESG fund It's very, very popular ESG fund. And um, it has 99% correlation in terms of holding and performance with Vanguard's one benchmark index. Although the only difference for those two funds is one claim is ESG, another is not claiming ESG. And what's the difference? Performance is similar and holding is similar, but the ESG fund charge more than 50 basis point to management fee for that one thing. Is that a tax for the investor? Just, just thinking about it. It's pretty much investing on the benchmark, but just because the fund used the name of ESG, you have to pay such tremendous money for that. I don't know how about this. What do you, how 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 invest can truly tell this is the ESG thing? How how BlackRock think about these things in terms of pricing for your funds and uh, advertising? Thanks. Yeah. No, that's a very good question, and it's very much something that, um, you know, it's part of our strategy, is something that we strive to do, is to offer the same pricing or uh, lower pricing for ESG strategies versus traditional uh, strategies. <laughs> uh, sometimes that is uh, difficult because the reality of it is that um, ESG indices use more data uh, and more insights than traditional strategies, right? When you when you start incorporating other elements to a traditional benchmark, you are also uh, incorporating those data, and you have to pay for those data and and those insights. And so that's really the difficulty, I would say. Um, but I think that the uh, the intention is very much that of making this available at competitive prices for everybody, right? That's what we're in the business to do. We're in the business to offer these these exposures to our clients so that they can build a portfolio with building blocks that are sustainable, sustainable versions of traditional exposures and at the same uh, price or less. And so that's very much something I believe in. It's, that's really why I came and worked uh, to work in the ETF and index side of the business. Um, and then in terms of, look, at the end of the day, uh, you also have to balance in product construction when you're, when you're building a product. You have to balance the appetite for, uh, you know, of our clients for having sustainable in it, but also at the same time, not taking a huge amount of active risk versus the traditional benchmark. And that's a really difficult uh, line to, uh, to walk on, by the way. And, you know, and so we, off, by the way, here too, we offer options and we certainly have products that are replicating much more closely their traditional benchmarks which are within very very small tracking errors and you know and perhaps on sustainability you have less improved performance but then you also have products that take much more active risk where you can really with more conviction invest in a certain theme or uh, or really pursue a certain uh, view of the market for example around the transition to low carbon you take more active risk um, but you know, you, you also have a significantly different uh, weight of companies compared to the traditional benchmark. And so that's really the balance. I, I can tell you that, um, you know, clients sometimes uh, want uh, a little bit of both. And that's why sometimes products are similar to their traditional counterpart. Okay. One, one point to, to add just on the, uh, this uh, range of options, if, if you want. Uh, it's true that sometime under the same banner of ESG, you can have actually quite uh, uh, different uh, approaches and, and, and maybe one to give a, a sense of some uh, easy numbers. Um, you, if, if you define ESG as I only want to avoid certain types of companies that I find problematic, then you may end up having something which excludes uh, maybe five to 10% of the universe because you've defined it in a way as just getting rid of certain very specific types of company for specific activity. You have other uh, uh, notions, if you want, which are, for example, trying to capture the leaders across you know, all the sectors in the market 
and you have uh, indices that would capture half the market, if you want, uh, only the leaders by sector. And that would be, you know, to, to Laura's you know, example of the, the sort of tracking error or active risk that you take, obviously that's uh, further away from, from market cap, but it's, it's you know, starting to look like uh, uh, really something different if you want, it's, it's half the market. And then you can go even further uh, and then exclude, you know, also entirety of sectors that you may find problematic. You know, for example, you can get rid of the entire energy sector because it's linked to fossil and that gets you even further if you want away from from the starting universe and and sometime you know the label you know is esg uh, but what's behind the label can lead to quite a, a lot of differences and and i think it's part of this education and learning curve where you know today uh, you know again it people may stay at the label uh, element uh, but it's also part of again adoption education that you know, it is important actually to go further, understand really uh, the approaches. And I think we're also getting into an, another stage, uh, which is also to provide more transparency on the characteristics of those uh, ESG funds or, or um, uh, so that it's easier in a sense to know whether you have, you know, something which is only excluding 5% or something which, you no know, really get half the market, but, um, or, or not. And, and again, uh, uh, BlackRock definitely, you know, is in this camp of providing as much information on the ESG characteristic as they would provide, you know, on the traditional metric, which we think is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you very yeah, much. Rick. Yeah, and if if I can just add one thing, I think the transparency angle is really important, and and that's why when you go to iShares, for example, and you see any product, you have a bunch of sustainability characteristics, and so you can see pretty clearly, and you can compare. There's like also a comparer tool, and you can just take like a traditional exposure and a sustainable, and you really see what drives the difference, and and you see the sustainability characteristics. And then I also found a stat that I had here, but. To our, to our like when we we researched the fees at the fees angle and we found that active sustainable equity mutual funds for example are about five times more expensive than our iShare sustainable ETF so it goes from 115 basis points on average to 22 basis points for our product so I think on the fees we're trying to we're really trying to help our clients there. Okay, thanks, Laura. Uh, great. Uh, so it, before our ESG panel, the New York Stock Exchange President Stacy talked about uh, money talks. So that is a way finance can change the world uh, to make the world more greener and uh, to do more sustainable investment. The point is, does it? Does money really talks? We all hear from investor side, from the uh, from the uh, re standard standard uh, uh, reporting side, from the pension fund. Is, is does ESG investment, in particular, the divestment, really change the firm's behavior to become greener and more responsible? I'd like to hear the answers. I saw Anne is, is shake, shaking the hand, but I'd like to hear that. But if you disagree with that money does not talk, what else could finance do to make the world greener, to make more sustainable? This is I like to hear thinking. Things and would you like to start? But limiting you talk to within two to three minutes, so we can finish timely. Thank you. Yeah, the um, in highly liquid public markets where it's very easy to buy and sell, and the New York Stock Exchange is obviously an important platform for that. Divestment is simply means that I sell my shares to someone else. Right. It's in a secondary market. It does not impact the company's finances um, very indirectly. Um, the debt markets, it's another matter. We can talk about that separately. But what we do is thereby run the risk that the company continues producing the emissions or causing whatever the problem might be, the impact on biodiversity or water shortage or um, work, workforce issues. By walking away from the company, we're not affecting it. Um, Second point, the focus has been on the producers of fossil fuel energy, oil, gas, and coal. And Carpus doesn't invest in thermal coal because we don't see a transition option for the industry. But for oil and gas, these are the energy suppliers to about 80% of the world economy. So just by selling your shares in the production side, you've still 
own 80% of the emissions in the demand, in the usage of that energy right across. So then the question is, well, we can't sell everything. Um, what we need to do is to transition, to transform, to engage these companies to build out the new strategies. Now, you, as I mentioned, we have 111 of these largest uh, emitters committed to net zero by 2050. That's come through investors making the request and require that companies do this. And then you'll also see that when companies aren't willing or able to make the response we expect, we will replace the board members. And that was the example of Exxon, where there have been engagement with big investors over many years on governance issues, risk reporting, financial performance, and more. So mm. now that the market understands, it's not just that money will talk, and I agree with Stacey on that, money will talk, but money will act. And the more that uh, investors come to realize the critical need for climate competent boards, not just boards that are independent and diverse, but also competent on these transition issues, I think we'll see more of, that, um, of those votes ensuring accountability. Likewise on the auditors. Right now there is a deafening silence from auditors regarding accounts that currently do not reflect the uh, Paris uh, commitments that companies are making. So that's got to be a gap that's closed too. Great. Uh, uh, Granville, what do you, you companies that try to set up the standard for these things, what do you say we finance can do, do a better job in terms of make the world greener? Well, I would just build on a lot of what Ann said. Um, you know, the, uh, the role that uh, disclosure has uh, to encourage and push companies to make concrete uh, their strategy and CapEx around pledges uh, to reduce their emissions. Um, many companies have, but many more uh, need to make concrete their pledges to reduce emissions. And you know the, the, the fact that we have seen this sure. substantial surge in net zero commitments is really a direct result of investor engagement. Um, and so, you know, your question, what can finance do? Anne touched on a lot of it, the, uh, the, the surge and then the implementation of net zero pledges is something that finance not only has done, but uh, 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 is likely to continue uh, to do. Um, but there are limits, there's no doubt. Um, you know, in the disclosure area, you know, disclosure would look fundamentally different if, for example, in the United States, you had a meaningful carbon price. Mm -hmm. And the connections to uh, uh, cash flow statements and, uh, uh, and income statements um, in, in the environment of a real carbon price, uh, you know, would be visible. And, you know, right now we don't have that. Um, and, uh, uh, and so government policy uh, is critically important to really capturing the catalytic effect that uh, the financial system has on operating companies. And, you know, whether or not we will see that in the U.S. Uh, is an open question. Great. Thank you. Uh, given the time, I'd like to finish this panel with last round of very, very brief questions. Clearly, all of you are the expert on ESG. My question is, what do you don't know about ESG, but you are curious to know about ESG? You have each of the have 45 seconds just to answer that question. Remy, please start. Sorry to give you a short preparation time. Oh, what I'm, I'm curious if you're on. It's, it's like there's so many things we, we're going to do in, in terms of modeling, processing new information, uh, thinking about new concepts. And again, I, I think with Laura, we, we actually exchange, you know, <laughs> during the summer on new metrics on, um, you know, on, 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 on measuring how companies are aligned, you know, uh, on the one to uh, 1.5 or two degree path. So there's so much, you know, that we actually don't know, but should invent that, you know, it's, it's more like being a kid in a candy store. 
for if you want in terms of you know thinking through concept and designing new metrics so i'll stop here because i could go on forever on, on this topic <laughs> okay laura <laughs> Yeah, I agree. It is really fun to be in this uh, in in this space, especially on the research side. So I can't complain. Um, I think that one um, one aspect of ESG that I think will will be interesting will be um, thinking about uh, how can we better how can we build better signals for not just where the companies are today. Uh, but where they're headed, right? And so Remy talked about some of these concepts around alignment with climate goals, and I think that we can expand that to also other aspects of ESG, really thinking about here's where the company is today, but where is it going to be in six months? Where is it going to be in a year? How can I, how can I gauge that? Because that's really the insight that I think can really help you drive performance and also drive change in the real world. I totally agree. Brando, last uh, closing uh, you know, I'll, I'll end where I started. Uh, you know, the, in the near term, we're going to see uh, much more robust disclosure uh, coalescing around uh, uh, standards that are going to come out of the SEC at the European Union level and, as I've said, the ISSB. Um, and I think that that portends uh, very positive uh, uh, developments for the ESG rating space for uh, folks at the asset managers who are trying to make decisions and build products uh, around reliable and comparable data. So I think that's a good news story in the near term, uh, but an awful lot of work remains to be done. Great, thank you very much. 